time I spent most of my time in the psychology, philosophy, religion sections reading this stuff, asking those basic questions. But it had come up, you know, it had come up from time to time. But there's a lot of other questions that seem to be related to survival that are more in the forefront. But for a lot of us, those thoughts, what's it all about? Why am I here in the first place? What's the purpose of my life? Those have come up from time to time. And, and what I start to do is to start to make those a priority and start to give my mind permission to ask some of the deeper ontological questions, sensing that, that it was very important to come to a purpose. I just didn't want to wander through life, get sick, grow old, and die. In fact, I questioned so much that when I was in college, you know, people would parents, friends, teaching assistants would just say, David, would you just cut it out, uh, get a life, uh, quit questioning everything. And I wasn't so much questioning the world, I was questioning my mind, my, my belief system. And they were like, you know, just, don't you ever hear of Shakespeare, all the world's a stage and everyone must play their part? And I said, yeah, play the part, grow old, get sick and die. Sorry, uh, I'm not into that. They said, but everybody does that. You can't escape that. I said, well, it's just not an option for me. Uh, there has to be something else besides growing old and, and getting sick and dying. So I would say in the most basic sense, with the Course in Miracles, for example, like we were talking about with Mary Williamson, you have a text, you have a workbook, and you have a teacher's manual. The text is it's kind of like going to science class. If you, if you don't read your assignment, you get in there to do the lab, uh, it can get pretty interesting. Uh, you may blow up the, the classroom or something, you mix in the alchemy, you start mixing a few things, it can get really interesting. So I always would, I'd do that some, but then I'd realize that it's not so good always cheating off of uh, your neighbor and looking around and watching them carefully uh, what to do. And I see Chris laughing, she has a master's degree in... <laughs> nuclear fusion. So she's laughing at my science and that's here. And I was in science. I would try to shortcut as much as I could and look over to the next one. But finally I started to say, I better read the text uh, before I attempt the experiments. And it sure made them a lot more meaningful. Uh, when I actually was prepared and went in to do the, the lab, the application, if I had the theory and if I had the conceptual ideas, it made the lessons application much more meaningful. It's the same with the Course in Miracles or any spiritual path. It doesn't matter how high your principles are and how true and how aligned they are. If you don't apply them, it's not going to give you peace of mind. In fact, I heard somebody tell me recently that they said, if you just took one spiritual principle, just one out of all that we read and learn, just one principle and applied it in your life across the board, in all your situations and everything, you could reach enlightenment so much faster than trying to accumulate hundreds of principles, you know, the 10, 15, 20, or like the, the Ten Commandments, you know, Mel Brooks made that movie, Blazing Saddles, I think it was called, and he's, Moses is carrying these two tablets, you know, I think, and I give you these 20, 10, 10, uh, 10 commandments, <laughs> he drops and of God's commandments. <laughs> so it's got, he quickly shifted gears, though, and, and covered it up. Twenty ten, And, you know, making fun at all these sacred kind of things, you know. And But if you took, like, Jesus emphasized the first two. If you took the first two, you know, love the Lord God with all thy heart, soul, and might, and love thy neighbor as thyself, and you simply applied it at work, at your family, at every, as you walk the streets or whatever, you're going to be a saint. Uh, very quickly. It's the application part that, that, that is really the most difficult, it seems. So what I do, and what I did was, I would say with the Course, you, I really scoured that text because I realized he was saying the same thing over and over and over in 31 chapters. He really was teaching the same thing. He, it was like a symphony. He'd come around and come again from a different angle. Kind of like a little bird flight coming in, or like one of our cats uh, coming up, purring and going, did you get it? Did you get it yet? Try this, did you get it yet? Well, try this one, did you get it yet? 
this is what the text is about. He's saying the same thing in 31 chapters. He says the same thing over and over and over. In fact, if you really wanted to boil the Course of Miracles down to one idea, I would say the serenity prayer is it. If you really wanted to get the whole text of A Course in Miracles, it would be that, you know, there's something you can change and there's something you can't change. And that your higher power, or the Holy Spirit, is the wisdom to know the difference. You can change your mind. You can accept your divinity. You cannot change the world. And I know many of us have been activists, and I was a big activist. Uh, it's about no nuclear proliferation, end world hunger, you know, stands on abortion, on vegetarianism, on everything under the sun. I wasn't a very happy, happy activist. I don't think I've ever met a truly happy activist. There's a lot of anger underneath that desire to change the world. But the Course teaches, seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. And that's really what the Serenity Prayer is teaching, and that's what A Course in Miracles is teaching. Now, in terms of keeping it really, really simple, I would say that you start to realize that you have a perceptual problem. Uh, you don't have what you think you've got. You have a perceptual problem. That was my first thing. In fact, in the 12 steps, you have to admit that you're powerless over your addiction, over your life as you've constructed it, before the higher power can do any good. Because if you have, are in such denial that you already think you've got it all figured out, you're not going to be in a position to have a transformation of consciousness. And so, I tell people, like, the 12 steps, they say, hi, my name's so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a drug addict, or whatever. You start off with, hi, my name's so-and-so, and I have a perceptual problem. Uh, Jesus was teaching this 2,000 years ago, when he said, before you get the speck out of your brother's eye, get the beam out of your own. Before there was a psychology, before there was Freudian words like defense mechanisms and projection and repression and all these things that came along with the field of psychology, it was still the same dynamics that were going on 2,000 years ago and long before that, that this world is a misperception, that in the Bible we're taught that you are looking through a darkened glass. We're also taught in the Bible, in Genesis and the early part of the Bible, that Adam fell asleep, but in no part of the Bible does it say, say that Adam woke up. Uh, so, if we just take that simple teaching from the Bible, we can say that this world is a dream, and that Adam falling asleep is a symbol for mankind being asleep. And then Jesus comes along in his Course in Miracles and says, well, in case you missed my message of 2,000 years ago, I'm going to make it real clear. And I'm going to use so many words to describe it in so many ways that if you really want to get what I'm talking about, you'll get it. Uh, you can, the ego will still try to twist my words around and quote scripture and take things out of context and mess the whole thing up. But if, if you really want it, I'm going to make it so that it's hard for the ego uh, to fool you. I'm just going to make it as simple as possible. And I was recently asked in California, somebody said, why is the A Course in Miracles over 1,200 uh, pages? Uh, isn't that uh, uh, pretty complicated for something as simple as God is? And, I, and somebody else answered the, their question saying, um, it's, uh, it's for uh, sophisticated schizophrenics. Uh, a Course in Miracles was written for sophisticated schizophrenics. Uh, oh, that's great. The Holy Spirit comes, the one guy asks the question, the other one says, it's sophisticated schizophrenia. Sophisticated, what? means complex. Uh, that's what the ego is. It's a very highly complicated thought system. And you probably have noticed, this world is a very complicated world. And schizophrenic, that's a split. That's describing a split mind. A sophisticated schizophrenic, then, must be somebody who's, who's got a split mind that's extremely complex. And that's why you need a 1200 page book. <laughs> because the mind is split and it's twisted and it's complicated. And that Jesus is 
going to have to say it in so many ways, hoping that one day, one moment, you'll go, aha, bravo, <laughs> I'm the Christ, God loves me, and everything that I thought and said and did, every pondering I ever had, everything I ever thought I did in this world amounted to nothing. But the good news is that I am love. What's the meaning of life? I am. In fact, there's even a workbook lesson where Jesus says, it's like he's saying, try this one on. I am the goal the world is searching for. To the ego, that's the most arrogant statement you could ever have. I am the goal the world is searching for. And yet Jesus is saying, humble. Accept this. You are the meaning of life. You, the spiritual you, the I am presence, before Abraham was, I am, before the world was, I am, is the meaning of life, and that is our true identity. And this world has been an attempt to take on a small, tiny, frail, little identity, and to try to puff it up, and to compare it against other identities gain a sense of self-esteem and worthiness. I was in college for 10 years. I had to unlearn it all. Uh, what does that mean? It means I had to empty my mind of thinking that, I, that any of it was true. Was it a waste? No, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I, I learned a lot in those uh, 10 years, and then I had to give it over to the Holy Spirit and say, it's yours now. Every, every word I ever learned in vocabulary, you use it. You speak through me. Everything I ever, I mean, I was shy when I was in high school. I was so shy, I was the most, most quiet in my senior class. I had like 230 some uh, people. But Moses stuttered. Uh, Gandhi was shy. Uh, we've all had things that we consider to be limitations. Who cares? If you give them over to the Holy Spirit, no problem. Holy Spirit can use anything. And so that's really what the most practical thing I can say is, is that I just was so willing to find that peace and to use whatever it took and to really admit, really, really admit that I was not seeing clearly, that I did not have uh, an idea of the big picture, that I had to humbly admit that even though I thought I had relationship problems and psychological problems and financial problems and health issues and I had environmental stands that I was taking and I was pointing the finger at people and I was an activist telling people they need to get their act together or else that actually I had a perceptual problem and I wasn't seeing clearly at all. And when I came to that admission did have a prayer of, please help me heal. Help me heal this crazy, distorted world that I'm seeing. And I don't see it the same as I did anymore. I could be over in Argentina when the bombs are dropping on Baghdad. I'm doing my healing sessions and rejoicing with people. In the midst of anti-American protests, you'll find me beaming. In the midst of going to the areas of seeming poverty or desolation or whatever, you'll, you'll find me laughing and smiling and sharing my glee and joy. I, I'm, I speak at funerals and I said, I'm the same way at funerals as I am at weddings and at every other picnic. It doesn't change. I was a hospice volunteer and I walked among those that seemed to be taking their last breaths on this earth. And I would carry trays of food up and down the hallway and these these people in the hospice would be going pss, pss, and I would go in and sometimes they would be incoherent but they would they would open their eyes with me and they would start asking me all these deep questions about the meaning of their life and I would say things like uh, don't don't hang on uh, don't worry about your, your mother or your child you're innocent you're perfect go to the light uh, you know the same message I'm not in there trying to raise the dead or heal the sick. I'm there to tell the message that you are perfectly innocent. And 
You don't have to hang on to anything, including a body. You can just accept your perfection right at this point. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter anything.